Well, good evening and welcome to these Monday night services here at the Ripley Baptist Temple. Our Monday night spring revival services here. We're excited to have you and your family listening this evening and trust that uh, you're enjoying the blessings of God here at the end of April. Well, it's been a beautiful day today. We thank God for his many blessings. We thank God for you tuning in and uh, I'm glad that we have victory in Jesus, aren't you? And, um, and the Lord's been good to us. And the Lord's good to us all the time. But I think of what Habakkuk prayed in uh, chapter 3 and verse 2. He said, uh, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, he said, revive thy work. And he, and he, and he prayed this. He said, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. I think that'd be a good prayer to pray right now, don't you? In wrath, O oh God, remember mercy. Revive us again. And that's what revival time's all about. And... Um, we got good news today from our governor. Things are beginning to move again in West Virginia. We've been looking forward to this day. It won't be long. It won't be long, I believe, until we're meeting again here in the pews, here at the Ripley Baptist Temple and other pastors that are listening from around the country are excited, I know, to get back into your church buildings and whatever form that may be initially, but we're excited and by the way, God is still on the throne. He's blessing, he's working, he's moving, and, uh, and there's victory in Jesus. Why is there victory? Because he rose from the dead. Why is there victory? Because he cried, it's finished. The atonement was made on Calvary. Brother Adam's going to come and lead us in that great old song, Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Sing with us as we sing. <laughs> you came from glory how he gave his life on calvary to save a wretch like me i heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning then i repented of my sin and won the victory
Amen. I'm thankful for that victory in Jesus. And we can read the last chapter in the book and we come out winners in the end. And let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer as we begin our services here this evening. Dear God, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us and how we can meet together, even though it may be virtually over the internet. But Lord, I just want to thank you that we can have services like this. We still have the freedom to do so. And Lord, I pray that Whatever happens tonight in our services, that you would revive our hearts tonight, Lord. And just be with these messages that uh, Dr. Olette has preached for us, that that would work in our hearts. Just be with everything that is done, that will be done for your honor and your glory. The special music, uh, the testimonies, whatever may be done tonight, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified and you would be honored. And just be with our church tonight, wherever they're at, out across uh, Jackson County and the surrounding area here as well. And also, there may be someone else tuning in tonight. Lord, I pray if someone's tuning in that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray you work on their heart and they'd see their need of a Savior. And just be with our services tonight. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Seth. And we're, we've been blessed throughout these uh, weeks with some great singing, some of it on site here. And uh, many, many songs have been sent in by our people and then we've enjoyed songs from folks from around the country. And tonight, uh, we're just especially blessed to have uh, Dr. Alton Beal singing for us in a little while, right before the message. But right now, we have Pastor Dan Vaughn, our good friend at Hopes Point Baptist Church in Weston, West Virginia. And uh, he's singing for us tonight. It's a great song. It's under the blood. I hope you'll enjoy it. of hurt and pain when I had gone astray. He wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way. He said, you're undeserving cause I know where you've been. I have the record of your life when you were bound by sin. I know your darkest secrets That you would never tell What makes you think you don't deserve A place with me in hell I heard the old accuser And this was my reply You're right for all the things I've done I sure deserve to die My righteousness is filthy rags My goodness is unclean There's only one thing I can say To what you said to me It's under the blood Oh, praise his dear name I'm not what I used to be My life has been changed Not shackled by sin and shame It's already gone I'm happy reminding you It's under the blood Victory was given me when I was born again. He washed my stained and sinful past and put new life within. No longer do I bear that mark that sin had brought my way. With happiness and peace of mind, praise God I now can say. It's under the blood, oh praise his dear name, I'm not what I used to be, my life has been changed, 
not shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. What can wash away? shackled by sin and shame it's already gone I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood Thank you, Brother Vaughn. Appreciate so much that song, and thank you for sending that in. And uh, we thank God for you and your wife and family and Hopes Point Baptist Church there in Weston, West Virginia. We're glad for what God's doing there and uh, what God's doing around this state and other places in these new church planting efforts. And Hopes Point Baptist Church is still a church not in its infancy, but in its childhood. It's a young church. Uh, pastor by Brother Vaughn and doing a great work. We're glad to partner with other independent Baptist churches around Ohio and West Virginia and, uh, and other places to plant churches right here uh, in, in our hometowns and or in, near our hometowns, in our, in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And uh, in the last six years, we've seen God uh, use us to partner together with uh, sister churches, many of you are watching tonight. Uh, Eastside Baptist Church, Markham, Ontario. We're glad for uh, Pickerington Baptist Temple in Southeast Columbus and Pickerington, Ohio. We're glad for uh, uh, Bible Truth Baptist Church there in Athens, Ohio. We're glad for Hopes Point Baptist in Weston. We're glad uh, for South Branch Baptist Church there in Petersburg, West Virginia. And I said all that to say this, be praying for uh, Pastor Mike Blake and uh, his family as they moved to Welch, West Virginia in McDowell County. And um, we had planned to be a part of church plant, a brand new church plant, in fact, beginning next week. And because of the coronavirus and the pandemic, we've had to uh, postpone that until around September, I believe. And so continue to pray. Continue to pray for, uh, I think, the Living Hope Baptist Church. Is that right, Pastor Grant? Living Hope Baptist Church, I, I believe, is the name of the new work there in Welch, West Virginia. And, uh, and of course, uh, Brother Blake, Mike Blake, is, is conducting Bible studies as we speak. And, um, but we're looking forward to a great launch through Baptist Church Planning Ministries, and, um, and, and that will be in September. That'll be in September. So I'm glad we can be a part of these things. And, uh, and I'm glad for Brother Vaughn. And I'm glad for our church families. I sure miss all of you and looking forward to having you back. Uh, in fact, we'll be able to come back together Sunday in our drive-in church. Brother Grant will say a, a word about that in just a moment. But we will begin every Sunday morning as we roll things out beginning this Sunday, May 3rd, with our drive-in church here right on the property, 1030. And, um, but we're glad to hear tonight our hometown highlight from Jim and Jane Willis. We love you all, love your family, Benji, and uh, we're going to hear from them at this time. Hello, church family. Jim and Jane Willis here. We just want to say that we miss each and every one of you. We miss coming together at church and worshiping the Lord. We enjoy the online services, the uh, Easter drive-in service was really great. Thank you to the pastors and to Adam Hager for making all those happen. And I miss singing in the choir, and I look so forward to just all of us being back together again soon. 
And we look forward to that too, Miss Jane, and uh, we look forward to being with our church family. And with that said, we're excited about um, some plans coming up this week. We look forward to being uh, here together Sunday morning, drive-in services at 1030 here, and uh, that'll be a fun time. You pray about the weather, pray about the logistics, and uh, we'll look forward to driving everybody in here to our church parking lot. Pastor will be preaching uh, from the parking lot just as we did on Easter Sunday, but here at our church, and that'll be at 1030 in the morning, and then we'll go online uh, for this evening services, and then again on Wednesday evening, back to our normal times. But it's great to, to be thinking about those things, as Pastor said, moving forward and getting back to some, some sense of normalcy. And uh, we are excited to be here on a Monday night in our revival services with Brother Willette. And uh, wasn't that a great message last night? And that was convicting and uh, very, very helpful to us as a church. And let's take these things to heart and uh, tune in to those messages. And, um, and each night this week through Wednesday, 7 o'clock, and uh, just two more really after tonight. So let's make the most of it and be a part of these things. A couple things there. Uh, we'd like for you to do tonight to respond and let us know a little bit about um, what's taking place with you. Of course, we've got our church family and always great to have our church, our Ripley Baptist Temple church family uh, here with our revival. But if you're watching from another church, maybe you're the pastor of a church or a church member from some other church tuning in, uh, would you maybe in the comments below on Facebook or even on, on YouTube, would you comment what church that you're watching uh, with or what church you're a member of and uh, that you're tuning in tonight watching our services? Let us know who you're with, especially if you're a pastor. We'd love to hear from you. And we're so thankful that you've come to be with us. And, uh, and please, everyone, share these services. And we want as many to benefit from this as possible. And uh, so comment the church that you're from. And then for all of us... Um, We've got on our website a button that says church service response. And if you'll go to ripleybaptisttemple.org, and if you've made a decision uh, through these meetings, or if the Lord's spoken to you in a special way and you'd like to comment about that, or at least uh, let us know what the Lord's doing in your heart, it'd be one way that you can respond to us. Of course, you can reach out to us by phone or text or even Facebook message. But if you go and click that button there on our website, there'd be kind of a form that you could fill out and let us know and you can comment there as to a decision that you've made, something the Lord's done in your heart. And it's been so great to hear from many people through these, um, through these online services and those who the Lord's speaking to. And uh, we'd love to help you if we can. Uh, of course, we want to help folks with the uh, telephone number for streaming our services over a telephone. And uh, they can call this number, the one 527 Three zero one zero. We've talked to so many that are using that, and uh, so many that can't use social media or have no uh, maybe internet connection, but they can pick up a phone and call and uh, share that with somebody. Let them know, and uh, we're so glad that that's available for them. And uh, we're just praying about all of these things and looking forward uh, to what God's going to do here tonight in the service. And a pastor's going to come and introduce our special singing. And uh, you be praying, have your Bible ready, and have your heart prepared for the message, Pastor. All right. Thank you, Pastor Grant. It's a special blessing tonight, again, to have uh, Dr. R.B. Willette preaching for us. I appreciate um, Brother Willette in so many ways. I appreciate his consistency over the years, his faithfulness to the work of God, his friendship uh, in, in the gospel. And I appreciate his great spirit in it all. And, uh, and I appreciate the fact that he's a Bible man, a Bible preacher, a King James Bible preacher. And uh, brought two tremendous messages yesterday. It really helped me, and uh, I know it helped you. And uh, and I read my Bible more today, and uh, prayed more. And uh, I don't think we can pray enough. I don't think we can read enough. But I, I but God dealt with me about some things, and I trust that tonight, in the service, that you're asking God to uh, speak to your heart. But also, it's good to have our good friend, Dr. Alton Beal, and, uh, who oversees the Ambassador Baptist College there, Chancellor of the Ambassador Baptist College in uh, Lattimore, uh, North Carolina. Uh, great preacher, great evangelist. I appreciate his friendship. And, and, uh, and also, he's a great singer and uh, sings from the heart. And right before Brother Willette comes to preach tonight, Dr. Alton Beal.
Well, hello everyone, and it's a joy to be a part of your service today. I know in these trying days, we uh, never fathom that we'd be meeting in the fashion that we're meeting now, but it's, uh, it's a privilege to be invited to be a part of your service. I hope that you folks are doing well uh, here at Ambassador. Uh, we're finishing our classes online, and uh, so pray for us. Uh, we certainly miss our students just like you as a church, miss your members uh, being in your midst. And so anyway, I'd like to share with you a song uh, today entitled Leave It There by Charles Tenley. Charles Tenley is probably uh, one of my most favorite songwriters. I just love the, the nature of his songs, the themes of them. And so I hope that in these days uh, that his song Leave It There will be a comfort to your heart. If the world from you withhold of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. When your enemies assail and your strength begins to fail, don't forget that God in heaven answers prayer. He will make a way for you and will lead you safely through. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. When your youthful days are gone and old age is stealing on and your body bends beneath that weight of care, He will never leave then he'll go with you to the end. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and Hello, Ripley Baptist Temple. Welcome to the Monday night service of our revival meeting. I'm so honored, Pastor Prime, that you let me have this chance to preach at your great church by means of the internet. And I want to thank all you folks who've been coming uh, to your devices on a regular basis and watching and being faithful. How many of you have participated in every service this far? 
Well, that's good. Uh, that, that was a wonderful response, as best I could tell. And how many of you have attended every weeknight service? Would you raise your hand? That's everybody, because this is the first one on Monday night, and I appreciate your being here. God's good to us. He loves us, and he has a good work to do in our hearts despite the circumstances all around us. I'd like you to take your Bible, if you would, tonight and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the Bible says in verse 13, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. I used to think that verse meant that if I don't have peace and holiness in my life, I won't see God. I won't have a relationship with him. But I think now that it means if I don't have peace and holiness in my life, no one will see the Lord in me. Boy, how we need that in these difficult days, to be at peace. The word peace, if you look it up, the word shalom, the first three synonyms are safe and well and happy. And that's how God wants his people to be in holiness, being like God. And then it says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great privilege of being your children and being your servants. And thank you for the honor that I have to preach to this wonderful church and for all that they've done to spread the word and to get people from other places to participate. Lord, I pray that your spirit would take your word and use it to plant truth in our hearts. Help us to determine to be good ground, good soil, to gladly receive what you have for us. Bind the devil and his demons. Don't let them interfere with the work you wish to do in our hearts and lives and help us to be attentive. Help us not to be distracted so easy in the settings in which we find ourselves to be distracted by various things, but help us to pay attention to you and to what you have for us and do work in our hearts. We'll thank you in Jesus' name for all that's done. Amen. I have a friend named Jim Van Gelder, and he preaches to young people. He's a great preacher. He can preach to anybody, and he does. But God's called him to minister to young people. And he said when he works with young people that the biggest problem they have is not immorality. That's the number two problem. He said the number one problem is bitterness. Isn't that interesting? People that are teenagers, haven't had a lifetime to accumulate difficulties and experience offenses and go through troubles and be mistreated, but their number one problem is bitterness. I'm going to make four statements, and then I'll give you three points for the sermon, but don't get excited when I say number three because it's a little longer than the first two, all right? It is like 75 subpoints or something like that. Statement number one, everyone has been hurt. Everybody's been hurt. Not the same way, not to the same extent, but that's life. Man is born to sorrow as the sparks fly upward. In the world, you shall have tribulation. He makes his reign to fall on the just and on the unjust, so everybody's been hurt. Number two, these hurts can turn to bitterness. They don't have to, but they can. Bitterness is a hurt you hang on to. It's one that you actually nourish by continual attention. Number three, God tells us to respond to these hurts with grace. Now, we think we know what grace is. Grace is uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is unmerited favor, we say. Now, those are good definitions. I think the best definition of grace I know is a divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. That fits every time I find the word grace used in the Bible. But grace is more than unmerited favor. If I came by your house and I said, could I please have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And you said, sure, brother, well, that, that would be unmerited favor. I didn't deserve it. I had done nothing to merit a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But I don't know. We'd call it grace. I wouldn't call the preacher up and say, Brother Prine, you would not believe the grace that one of your members showed me why they gave me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But I went by your house. I took an ice pick and I punctured the tires of all your vehicles. 
I poured sugar and sand down your gas tanks. I soaked all your windows. I kicked out all your flowers from the gardens. I took the laundry you had outside and pulled it down and trampled it in the mud. I turned your dog loose. And then I said, could I please have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? If you gave me one then, that would be great. Grace is more than unmerited favor. Grace is favor shown where there is absolute demerit. You see, when God saved us, we were His enemies. When Jesus died, He died for those who hated Him. He died for those who were estranged from Him. And so for the purpose of our discussion this evening, grace is essentially giving good to people who deserve bad. So number one, Everybody's been hurt. Number two, these hurts can turn to bitterness. Number three, God tells us to respond to these hurts with grace. Now, I would go that far in teaching on this subject for a long time. In fact, the first book the Lord allowed me ever to have put in print, which is now called When You Can't Just Get Over It, as a chapter in bitterness. But as I studied this passage, I saw something I'd never seen before. Here's a free thought. If you hear a preacher preach something from the Bible and you say, wow, I'd have never known it meant that if he hadn't told me, it's probably not true. But hear a preacher preach and you say, wow, I never saw that before, but that's what it says, then it's probably true. You see, I would talk to people about bitterness. I would go through the Scripture. I'd use this passage, and I, I, I would encourage them, and, and they, they'd get it right. They'd come to an altar after a sermon, and, and they would say, God, I want to get rid of bitterness. I would have preached it's a poison root. You've got to remove the root of bitterness. It's a, it's, a, it's a poison that you feed yourself. It's a cancer that eats you up from the inside out. And they would come and confess it and get it right with God, and it would work for a while. Then something would happen. An anniversary of a terrible event. Somebody who'd been out of their life would come back into their life for a while. A child would turn the same age its mother had been when something awful happened to her. And all those feelings and all those emotions would come roiling back up to the surface, and they'd say it didn't work. Here's number four. Everybody's been hurt. These hurts can turn to bitterness. God tells us to respond to these hurts with grace. But number four, dealing with these hurts is not a one-time experience, but an exercise that must be repeated every time the hurt springs up. I would suggest to you there's nothing in our text about removing the root of bitterness. No, the assumption in our text is that the roots are there, that they stay there, and that every once in a while they come up, and every time they come up, we've got to respond with grace all over again. You see, a lot of things in the Christian life are an exercise. Oh, we live in a society that wants everything to be instant. We want to take a pill. We want to have an operation. Uh, we want to have a quick fix. The Bible tells us to exercise ourselves unto godliness. I exercise. I often tell people that because they would never suspect so otherwise. But about three to six times a week, I get on the treadmill, and I do an hour on the treadmill. I, actually, I'm getting so good at it, I'm about to start moving the pedals. I did an hour yesterday, Sunday afternoon, between the morning and evening services at our church. Now, here's the truth. If you exercise one time really, really hard, if you get your heart rate up, if you go to your maximum aerobic capacity, if you give it everything you've got, if you could measure everything about your health, before and after that one time of exercise, there would be so little difference you could barely detect it. If you have to choose between exercising one time and never, choose never. But if you exercise over and over and over and over again, well, it has a great effect on you. I have a low resting heart rate, usually in the high 50s or low 60s. I have low cholesterol. I have a low IQ. Uh, but not because of any one time of exercise, because I did it again and again and again and again and again and again. And the Bible's giving us an exercise. It's saying these roots are there. They're going to spring up. And every time they come, you'll have to respond to them with grace. So let's look at our text. Number one, the Bible talks about roots. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Roots are interesting. Roots are always covered. 
You have beautiful topography in West Virginia. I love your state. And you have nice trees. I've heard people compliment the branches on a tree, the fruit of a tree, the flower of a tree, even the bark of a tree. But I've never heard anybody say, wow, that tree has great roots. They're covered. If I could look at you tonight, I wouldn't really see you. I wouldn't see the turmoil of your heart. I'd just see the expression you choose to place on your countenance. They're covered. Number two, these roots are caustic. They're roots of bitterness. There are some experiences we've had. There's some people that have hurt us. There's some things that have happened that just when we think about them make our mouth pucker up like we're sucking on a lemon. They're bitter. It'll always be true that your best friend betrayed you. It'll always be true that your husband left you and abandoned the children. It'll always be true that somebody got the promotion you should have had at your job. It'll always be true that uh, power-hungry governmental officials have been excessive in their control in many areas of our life. And that'll always be true. Caustic. The roots are covered. The roots are caustic, but the roots come up, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Interesting. It doesn't say they inch their way out of the soil. It doesn't say they grow gradually. No, it says they spring up. Boom, they're back all of a sudden. They come up. I heard about a young man who was preaching one of his earliest sermons. He'd been called to preach. And he'd worked really hard. He'd read about a lot of other preachers and things they'd said. And as he preached, an older lady, about two, three rows back in the aisle seat, thought she recognized where some of his material had come from. And uh, uh, as he preached a little bit, she said, that's Charles Spurgeon. He thought that was kind of rude, but he just went on preaching, figured it'd be all right. And a little while later, she thought she recognized another source, and she said, that's D.L. Moody. And uh, this time he stopped and he glared at her. He figured that would take care of it. It didn't. A little while later, he was preaching along, and she said, that's Billy Sunday, and he'd had all he could take. He said, lady, would you shut up and let me finish this sermon? And she said, that's you. It came up. Do you know, we like to think that our bad behaviors are aberrations. Well, that's not really me. I was just in a bad place. I'm not usually like that. So let me ask you a question. You're a smart group of people, and I didn't tell you there'd be a quiz, but I'm sure you'll do just fine. If I squeeze an orange really hard, what comes out? Very good. Orange juice. Now, question number two. Why does orange juice come out of the orange when I squeeze it really hard? Hmm. Exactly right, because that's what's inside the orange. If I squeeze it just right, could I get tomato juice? If I squeeze it hard enough, could I get grapefruit juice? No, I can't get anything out of the orange that's not already in the orange. Did you know nobody ever said a bad word that they'd never heard when they hit their thumb with a hammer? It has to be in there in order to come out. So those unkind words that we spoke to our family earlier today because of the tension and difficulty we're facing, that's you. Uh, those harsh statements that you made about somebody the other day that weren't really godly and weren't really necessary, that's you. They come up, the roots. But think about the results of bitterness. This is really intriguing. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Why do we hang on to these hurts? Why are there some people, you know them, some of us may be like this, and, and every time we get a chance, we tell somebody about the terrible things that have been done to us and the awful things that have happened to our past and the, the awful way we've been treated. Why do we do that? Well, you know, we do that because there's some things that are just so bad they don't deserve to be forgiven. and uh, We don't ever need to forget the, the awful things that those people did and the terrible harm they caused to our life. Why, they don't deserve to have it set aside. 
Interesting. Because the first result of bitterness is difficulty for you. Trouble you. Not them, you. When I was in college, my dad said, son, I've been talking to a preacher friend of mine. His son was also in the college. And he said, his son told him that you said you hated his guts and wanted to punch his face in. I said, dad, I never said that. And dad said, well, son, you need to go and make it right. And I said, dad, I didn't do anything wrong. Why should I make it right? Hoping for some amens there. Hey, think about this. Who is responsible to take the initiative to get things right when there's a problem between Christians? Is it the person who caused the offense or the person who has taken offense who's been offended? Who do you think? Matthew chapter 5. The Lord Jesus says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. All right, he may be right, he may be wrong, but you've caused the offense. It may be accurate, it may be inaccurate, but he's upset with you. You've caused the offense. Jesus said, you leave your gift before the altar. First, go find your brother, be reconciled to him, then come and offer your gift. So Jesus very clearly said in Matthew chapter 5, if you have caused the offense, you take the initiative to make it right. But in the same gospel, a few chapters later, chapter 18, our Lord is speaking. And he said, therefore, if you have aught against your brother, go to your brother alone. Tell him his fault between he and thee. Wait a minute. Matthew 5, he said, if you've caused the offense, you take the initiative. Matthew 18, he said, if you've taken offense, you take the initiative and go to get it settled. In other words, the Lord Jesus doesn't want us sitting around trying to figure out whose fault it is. He just wants us to get it right. So, I went to this young man. I said, my dad said that your dad said that you said that I said that I hated your guts and I wanted to punch your face in and I never said that. Then you know what happened. The Spirit of God convicted him about his lie and the slander of me. He burst into tears. He fell into my arms. We became the best of friends. He went into business, became extremely successful, and just last week wrote me a check for $500,000. This is a tough crowd. I sense even over the Internet that you're not buying my story. No, here's what happened. He said, eh, it's okay. It's okay? You lied about me. You got me in a situation with my dad, and it's okay. Well, it didn't work, did it? Oh, no, it worked. I obeyed God. I honored my father. I had a clear conscience. Years went by. I graduated from college, was a youth pastor two years, came to the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport, where I had the opportunity to serve as pastor for 44 years. I've been at our church a little while, maybe oh, two, three years. We were trying to have a big day. Trying to have 500 in Sunday school, biggest day in the history of the church. And this young man's dad had a ministry that had a singing group that went out and traveled. And I invited the group. I think there are 13 or 14 people in the group. And, and I, I think we had 503 in attendance. So one secret to having big days is to invite large groups. We had a good time. We ate dinner together. We talked about our friends and where they were serving God and who was doing what, where. And a couple of weeks later, I got a letter from this young man. Dear Brother Willette, I needed to write and tell you that for all these years, I have harbored against you not bitterness. Here's another freebie. I have limited success helping bitter people see they are bitter. I'll go through the scripture. I'll tell them what the Bible says. I'll say, I think you have a problem with bitterness. And the typical response is, I'm not bitter. Got it. <laughs> Don't know how I could have made that mistake. Not bitterness, he said, but a trace of resentment. Hey, I'm not sure, but I think that's Greek for bitterness. Now, here's the interesting thing. All those years that that young man had had a trace of resentment against me, it never bothered me one time. We're friends. He came to my dad's 85th birthday. He was at my mother's funeral, and we've been at other occasions together. We're, we're friends. Everything's fine. 
But it never kept me from enjoying going soul winning. It never kept me from having a good time going out to eat with my wife or fellowshipping with our church people. No, the bitterness that he hung on to never did anything toward the one he held. It only hurt him. Bitterness is going to bring difficulty for you. It will harm you. It is a poison you feed yourself. It does eat you up from the inside out. Difficulty for you. Uh, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you. But the second result of bitterness is this. The Bible says, and thereby many be defiled. Defilement for others. And then our text goes on to mention Esau. I won't take time to develop it, but I believe the Bible would teach us that Esau is not particularly an example of a man who was bitter, but of a man who was defiled by the bitterness of another. His mother had been promised that Jacob would be the leader. The elder shall serve the younger. And she loved Jacob. Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. He was a mama's boy. He liked to knit and crochet. Esau was an outdoorsman. He liked to hunt and he liked to fish. And Rebecca saw that God's plan wasn't being fulfilled his promise wasn't being kept and she took matters into her own hand and she got Jacob to lie to his own father her own husband and the Bible says Esau became a profane man a fornicator if you read the Bible you'll find out that he married the people he married because he saw that it displeased his parents not only difficulty for you but defilement for others I've been in churches where there's a cloud. And I could tell my funniest story, my most touching illustration, and nothing would pierce the darkness. And I stayed long enough to find out what I thought was the reason the preacher was bitter. Oh, he'd been hurt badly, and he'd suffered some great things, but he had allowed it to fester, and he hadn't dealt with it with grace, and he hadn't obeyed the Bible, and his bitterness clouded the entire congregation. You can't be bitter. It'll defile your children. You can't be bitter. It'll defile the people you try to minister to. You can't be bitter. It'll harm other people. It not only brings difficulty for you, but defilement for others. So what do you do about it? What's the remedy for bitterness? Well, Number one, the Bible says give it grace. Let's break that down a little bit. Let me suggest three things that are necessary if you're going to deal with people with grace. Number one, you have to have faith. How can you do good to people who deserve bad? Because you have faith that God will honor you for that. You have faith that God will take care of the situation. It may be like the young man I went to in college, and it was years later before it got settled on his end, but my heart was clean all that time. Faith. Let me ask you a question. Is there a God? Answer out loud. Is there a God? Does He love you? Did he promise to work all things together for good to those that love him and those that were the called according to his purpose? Huh. Roger Powell was our music director for 12 years. Wonderful man. Sweet wife, great family. His uh, daughter Jessica was, I think, eight years old. It was a Wednesday night and the I came into the church, she ran up and grabbed my leg and gave me a big hug and said, Uncle Preacher, I'm going to God's country tonight. They were going to go to Georgia to a wedding. Jessica's sweet girl always, always felt God wanted her to be a missionary. They rented a van to make the trip more comfortable. They left that winter evening, the roads were clear, but they got down around Ann Arbor, Michigan, and an overpass was icy, and the van slipped and smacked against the guardrail. They were okay. Bumps, bruises, didn't require much treatment. Except that uh, Jessica had been lying on the floor trying to sleep. And the window next to her seat popped out when the van hit the guardrail. And she got thrown out of that window and smashed to the pavement and died. They went to the hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital in Ann Arbor. And the chaplain came and very piously said, Well, there are some things God can't help, but he wants to be there to help us through those things he can't help. Shut up. Not my God. Our God sitteth in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And Roger Powell, 
in spite of the terrible grief of that awful situation and the shock of, of seeing his daughter's body lifeless on the pavement, looked into the eyes of that unsaved man and he said, Mister, this was not an accident. This was an appointment. Faith. You see, what's good about that? Oh, Romans 8.28 doesn't say all things are good. It says... All things work together for good. One good thing God brought from that is Brother Powell wrote a tract. We still print it at our church called the Jessica Tract. Her pictures on the front, her stories inside, and people come from other churches and ask for those tracts and take them throughout and witness, and hundreds of people, I believe, have trusted Christ as their Savior because of that tract. She always wanted to be a missionary. Through our Christian school, we do a great big Patch the Pirate play every other year. Huge sets and costumes, really, really fine production. That year, we're doing a play about going to the mission field. Patch the Pirate goes to the jungle. And since Jessica had always wanted to be a missionary, we dedicated the play to her, put her picture on the back of the program. Play was done, I gave an invitation. And a young man came from over here and he said, I think God wants me to be a missionary. And a young lady came not far behind him and I, she said, I think God wants me to be a missionary. And Rodney Rupel and Becky Swain went off to Bible college and they got married and they went to Cambodia. And 20 plus years they've been serving God, wonderful missionaries. I don't know everything God was doing, but I know some things he was doing. Faith. Second part of the equation it's not only faith, but forgiveness. In whom we have forgiveness by His grace. Grace will make us forgive people. Oh, yes, I know you got to forgive and forget. Eh, not really. I don't know if you can forget. Supposing I said, forget your name. And then three minutes later, ask you your name. Would you still know your name? What mechanism could you employ to erase your name from your mind? Some people say you never really forget anything. It's all in there somewhere. Now, you can't always remember it when you want to. I heard about an old guy, and uh, his friend said, How you doing, man? I know you've been having some health problems. He said, Oh, I'm doing a lot better since I got on this new medicine. He said, Oh, really? What medicine is it? He said, It's, um, um, oh, he said, What's the name of a flower? It's usually red. It smells pretty. It's got thorns on it. He said, Rose. Yeah, yeah. He said, Hey, Rose, what's the name of that medicine I've been taking? He's not as bad as the two old guys I heard about. And they uh, were sitting on the porch in their rocking chairs. One of them looked at the other and said, I always forget, was it you or your brother that was killed in the war? Nah, forgiveness doesn't mean to forget. You know what it literally means? It means to cancel the debt. When I asked Jesus to be my Savior, <clears throat> the debt of all my sins was canceled. And he remembers them no more. I uh, heard about a man who went to a marriage counselor. Just a story because men don't go to marriage counselors unless they're brought in by their wives. That's because men never have any problems that they admit to. This man went to a marriage counselor, and the counselor said, what seems to be the problem? He said, well, every time we get into a disagreement, my wife just gets historical. And the counselor said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, I mean historical. She brings up everything I've ever done. That means they were never forgiven. Supposing I borrow $10 from him, I say, I'll pay you tomorrow. I see the next day, I say, man, I forgot the $10, I'm sorry. I'll give it to you tomorrow. I see you that day, I'm sorry, I forgot it, I'll give it to you tomorrow. This goes on for several days. And finally you say, brother, well, that, you know, don't worry about it. I'll just forgive that debt. You can do that. Or you can say, man, I need the $10. Hope you pay me back. Or I wish you'd pay me back. I'd like to think better of you than to think you wouldn't honor your word. But you choose to forgive it. You can do that. What you can't do is forgive the debt and then ever ask me for the $10 again. What you cannot do is forgive the debt and then tell other people that I still owe you $10. No, nah, if you've forgiven the debt, it's canceled. See, when I forgive somebody, I don't get to bring up their past and, and hold them accountable for what they've done again. The best definition I read of forgiveness 
from a human perspective, was agreeing to live with the unchangeable consequences of another's sin against me. Forgive. But there's a third part for the remedy of bitterness. We not only must have faith, we must forgive, we must fight. Oh, you sound like this part. Who do I get to hit? And how many times? And what's the fight about? Well, the fight's about your mind. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. How do you do that? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, the battle for success or failure in your Christian life is fought and waged and won or lost in your mind. Whoever controls your mind controls you. So how do you fight against these feelings, these things that still pop up every once in a while? How, how do we deal with the need to forgive them, to do good to people who deserve bad? Well, you use the Word of God. When the devil tempted our Savior in the wilderness, every temptation was answered by the Lord Jesus with Scripture. He could have just said, you go back to hell where you belong and leave me alone, and the devil would have had to obey. But when the devil said, uh, why don't you take these stones and turn them to bread because you, you're hungry, and Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And the devil said, I know a little Bible too. Why don't you jump off this pinnacle here? And because he said he wouldn't dash, let you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the devil said, I'll tell you what, he took him to a high place and showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, all oh, this shall be thine if thou wilt bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. In him only shalt thou serve. The Word of God was the answer every time. It's the answer for me. It's the answer for you. So here's what I recommend. Take whatever issue you have and get you a Bible verse that answers it. And every time that thought comes into your mind, you quote that Scripture. I have a book used to be called The Pulling Down of Strongholds, and it talks about how to deal with those things. It's now called Rewired. There's a list of scriptures in there, but you don't have to get the book. You can get that from your pastor. He'll help you. Uh, you can call the church here. We'll give you a verse that'll help your particular situation. And every time that thought, that urge, that feeling comes, you quote that verse. Quote it out loud if you can. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And then you'll find yourself having to quote it maybe a thousand times a day. I can't prove what I'm about to suggest, but I think you'll find it happen. After a while, you'll have to quote it 500 times a day. And then 200 times and 100 times and 50 times, because I think the devil will get tired of every time he tries to draw you away from God, he, you wind up going back to God, and he'll leave you alone. you got to fight. The remedy for bitterness, faith, forgiveness, fighting the battle of your mind. I heard about a young lady who'd been attacked, and abused in the most awful manner imaginable. She was devastated. She went to her pastor, and her pastor gave her some really strange but really biblical advice. He said, the Bible says you should love your enemies. It does. Not what you want to hear in her situation. But the Bible is such a wonderful, helpful, practical book. It tells us exactly how to do that. It goes on to say, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. And so this young lady covenanted that she would only say good things about the man who had attacked her. That she would... Uh, not say any bad thing about him, say good things about him, and she would do good things to him, and she would pray for him. She maybe sent him some anonymous gift to help in his time in jail. She prayed not that God would judge him, not that he'd get a long sentence, but that he'd be saved, that his life would be changed. And it didn't happen all at once. It was an exercise. 
But gradually, over a period of time, the cloud lifted and the sun began to poke through and she went on to have a great life, got married, had children. Years went by. She was in a grocery store. She turned around the end of an aisle and came face to face with that man. He had finished his sentence and been released from jail. And she looked into his eyes and felt nothing. The Word of God, consistently applied over a long period of time, had given her victory. Everybody's been hurt. These hurts can turn to bitterness. God tells us to respond to these hurts with grace. Dealing with these hurts is not a one-time experience, but an exercise that must be repeated every time the hurt springs up. Our Heavenly Father, would you help us, please? Speak to our hearts by your Spirit. Help us to be honest and help us to be obedient. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody looking. I can't see you, but God does. I wonder if you would lift a hand to him and say, Lord, I, I need to deal with this. Your Spirit has spoken to my heart. I need to settle some things. Help me to covenant to fight the battle with your word to cancel the debt and remind myself of the fact that it's been canceled whenever it springs up again. God, would you help my friends, all the people who are listening to this truth now, to hear your Spirit and to allow Him to do His work in their heart. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I wonder if there's somebody there and you say, I don't really know I'd go to heaven if I died right now. Would you let me talk to you for a minute? You look at the screen. Did you know God loves you? God so loved the world. He wants to spend eternity with you. He never wants you to be separated from him. But there's a problem. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the penalty, the wages for our sin is death, death in hell. Can't pay for your sin by being a good person or joining a church or giving gifts to people or getting baptized. No, if we're going to pay for our sin ourselves, we have to die and spend eternity in hell. But the Bible says Christ died for us. It says even more clearly, Christ died for our sin. Hey, the wage of sin is death. Jesus died for us. He paid the penalty we owe. The wage of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God loves you. Jesus already paid for your sin. The question isn't what about your sin. The question is what will you do with God's Son? The Bible says as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. The Bible says whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from their sin. Saved from death and hell. So I'm going to invite you to trust the Lord Jesus and Him alone to forgive your sin. To accept and believe that He died on the cross and paid for all your sins. And the moment you ask Him to, He'll forgive your sin and promise you everlasting life in heaven. He'll make you His child. I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer in a moment. I want to tell you ahead of time so you know exactly what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to say something like this, Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven, but I believe you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross. I trust Jesus and Him alone to forgive my sin, to become my Savior, and to take me to heaven when I die. Would you say that to the Lord? Bow your head with me. Pray this prayer from your heart to God. Mean it from your heart. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. Tell Him. He'll hear you. I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I believe you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for my sin. And I trust Jesus and Him alone to forgive my sin, to become my Savior, to take me to heaven when I die. Close your prayer by saying in Jesus' name, Amen. If you just prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to be your Savior, we'd like to give you a book that will help you along in your Christian life. I believe there'll be some information on the screen from our friends at Ripley Baptist Temple. Or if you want to contact uh, me at uh, my home, First Baptist Church of Bridgeport, it's 2400 King Road, Bridgeport, Michigan, 
888-489-4872 or call us 989-777-0210 or if you'd like you can go to us by email our website is the number two and then the letters fbc.com or if you want to email directly it's office at the number two fbc.com God bless you for being part of the service don't miss tomorrow night Tuesday night God wants to do great things in our midst and I'll see you then Thank you, Brother Willette. What a great message and what a needed message. And um, I trust that it helped you tonight. It certainly helped me. I believe one of the great keys to revival is us not only getting right with God, but getting right with our fellow man. And if you made a decision tonight, as Brother Willette has already given you some information, contact him or contact us here at Ripley Baptist Temple. We want to encourage you. We want to help you either in your newfound faith or this new walk that you're making, this new decision you're making. We want to help you. And um, that's what revival is all about. Revival is recovering from a state of neglect. And how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Thanks for listening tonight. And tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, I know we had a hiccup or two tonight. We apologize for that. appreciate Brother Hager, Adam Hager, helping us through that. This is about our 20th broadcast, and that's really the first major problem we've had. And we apologize for that, but thank you for staying with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow evening. Great singing, great preaching, 7 o'clock. Join us. God bless you. Until next time.